Everybody will here with this week's interview chair. This week on the chair, we have Mr. Richard Paquette, man with three hats on, Aubrey professional handler, breeder, Aubrey judge. He's been an all in our sport. So sit back and listen to Richard. Hi, everybody. Will Alexander here. Uh, this week on the interview chair, we have Mr. Richard Paquette, ex-professional handler, all breed professional handler, all breed judge, and breeder of Shih Tzus and Lakeland. How are you, Richard? I'm excellent, uh, Will. Life is good. Where are you? Are you in Sudbury? I am up in Sudbury at the Wenrick Homestead, and uh, the weather up here has been amazing, and I have the ability to see my grandchildren who live on the property. So uh, apart from not seeing Jody's on a more regular basis, I do have four grandkids. So being sheltered in place and on the lockdown hasn't been too bad for me. Oh, well, that's good. And it's, and it's Jody's birthday today. It is Jody's birthday. Yeah. It was. We better say the date. What's the date today? <laughs> <laughs> June. Today is June the 3rd. June the 3rd. Yeah. June, happy birthday, Joan. <laughs> I think I already sent her a message anyway. And I saw your message to her. So. All right, we're going to get right into it then, Richard. Let's start off with tell me how you got involved in the sport of dogs and how old you were when you got involved in the sport of dogs. Well, I was 17 years old when I got involved in purebred dogs. Uh, Wendy Paquette and I were high school students and uh, we ended up uh, inheriting a rescue Samoid. And uh, it's kind of a interesting story of what ifs because uh, this Samoid, uh, again, we didn't have any papers for him or anything. And I asked the previous owner who, unfortunately, the reason we got the dog was that he was in jail and, and wasn't a you know, good owner for the dog, not <laughs> responsible in any way, shape or form. So we got approached by a young couple up here in Sudbury that had a female Samoid and we knew nothing about purebred dogs or anything. We knew we had this beautiful Sammy and we kept immaculate care of him. And he had a beautiful rough and he was a magnificent looking dog. So they uh, convinced us to get involved in showing and breeding by giving us the hooker. Uh, Wendy and I were uh, high school students and we were actually living together. I was 17, Wendy Paquette was 15. We had our own little one bedroom apartment in our little pet Samoid. And we met this couple who tried to convince us to get into dog showing, et cetera, because they said our dog was magnificent. Well, they hounded us and hounded us. And the final hooker for us was, our apartment rent was $75 back there in the early 70s. And they said, we'll give you $200 if you let us breed to your dog. They had a female Sammy. One can, couple of conditions, does he have registration papers? And second, you need to take him to a dog show. So that's how we got started. The funny part about the registration papers, when we contacted the uh, previous owner who was in jail and his car in the police impound he said yeah the car the papers are in the glove box of my car uh you can go and get them i'll sign them over to you so i went to the police impound and i said i had the keys for the guy's car can i go and get something out of the glove box no way mister you're not going to be doing that i'm sure the statutes of limitations is over on my minor crime which evolved that night where I snuck into the police <laughs> oh, inbound <no. laughs> with the keys and got those registration papers and what if what if I had never got those papers I would not be involved in purebred dogs today so that's our starting <laughs> point and uh, I was having a lot of fun showing the dog uh, went to our first show in Sault Ste. Marie and uh, shaking and showing and perspiring and I had the Hearts Mountain six foot brand new chain lead and beautiful red collar on him and took him into the show ring and 
won the breed over specials. And that was the bite for us. We got uh, a lot of people helped us out and mentored us, gave us some good advice to get started. And uh, eventually we were at a dog show in Kingston, Ontario. And Wendy Paquette was getting bored and she said, I'm going to go and get my own breed. And I said, knock yourself out. There's 150 different breeds here. And she wandered around the show, came back a few hours later and said, I picked my breed. And I said, what is it? She said, the Shih Tzu. And she had happened upon Mrs. Pat Dixon, very famous uh, original Shih Tzu pioneer in Canada. And uh, she had with her Carrie Mounta Ting Ting an eight month old puppy. And Wendy Paquette walked up to Pat Dixon and her first words out of her mouth were, ma'am, if I ever get a dog like this, would you let me breed to your dog? And Mrs. Dixon being the amazing person she is said, yes, young lady, if you get a dog like this, I'll let you breed to my dog. So the long and the short of that story is that Pat Dixon did become our mentor her kennel name was Wyvern. And again, she had dogs from the Carrymount line and the Carry, the Creeks from Carrymount are well famous in the early history of our breed, both in Canada and the USA. And uh, the, the long and the short of that story is, Pat helped us get a dog from England. We bred that dog to Pat's dog. It became uh, our fir very first litter of Shih Tzu which through Pat's mentorship and our success was our very first Wenrick champion, our very first multiple best in show winner, and our very first national champion, beginner's luck out of our very first litter of Shih Tzu. And the keynote thought on this is you need a good mentor if yeah, you're gonna yeah. succeed in this, bent, this business. And we had great mentors in uh, Shih Tzu, and we had great mentors, you know, in our careers as dog handlers and and as now all breed dog judges. Well, let's not jump too far ahead. I want to know what happened after we got into Shih Tzu because you, you, I want to know when you started showing dogs. I want to know about Danny. I want to know about all those things. So don't jump ahead on me, Richard. <laughs> well, that was in the early to mid uh, 70s. And we had our uh, our pet Sammy and we ended up with another dog through one way or another, a Sammy. Then we acquired the two Shih Tzu, and then we acquired two Afghans. And that was all in the early 70s. <laughs> but we got really big, really fast. And uh, we really enjoyed the, the, the sport. We enjoyed traveling to the dog shows in Southern Ontario, showing our own dogs and, and having a lot of fun that way. And then people started to ask us to show their dogs, you know, a lot of the local Siberians, because we live you know, basically four hours from any dog show and, uh, you know, in remote northern Ontario. So we uh, started showing dogs for other people and moved out to the country here in Azilda on 10 acres and built uh, the homestead and the kennel. And it's been go ever since. So again, those early successes in Shih Tzu, um, you know, Lots of best in show winners, lots of uh, national specialty winners in Canada. And, uh, you know, we, we did breed the Sammies for about 10 years and then eventually moved on from them to specialize primarily in the Shih Tzu. And it's been, um, you know, our, our most successes have obviously been in the Shih Tzu. And, and, and not to brag, but, you know, Wendy Paquette and I, through that Wenrick Shih Tzu, we're known internationally and we have breeding stock in 20 or 30 different countries around the world. So it's given us an opportunity to give back to the sport where we now mentor a lot of other people. Oh no, Enric's world renowned. You know, everybody knows who Enric is. So. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of fun. And uh, again, coming from those early beginnings were like a couple of non-doggy people from remote Northern Ontario, reached the pinnacle of success we've been able to do. And I humbly say that because we have been truly blessed. We've got to, tr you know, to travel all over the world showing dogs and now travel all over the world judging dogs. And uh, with each trip, we always try to stay a little extra and do some sightseeing, 
and do pre present seminars. And uh, it's been a lot of fun and a really great go of it. So you're still jumping head on me, Richard. <laughs> I want to know what the handling career first. Uh, how, how did you, 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 people asked you to show dogs, but you guys became quite prominent as handlers up here. And with a, with a big rig, you were the first one to have that huge truck up here. So like, tell me how that all started. Well, um, again, when we started back in the early 70s, we treated it like a business. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but for the first 10 years of our careers in dogs from 1970 to 1980, I worked as an underground miner in the mines at Inco. And I worked the steady graveyard shift and uh, uh, an accident forced me out of the mines. And then we started doing the dogs full time. So like you say, we just kept acquiring um, dogs and getting great mentors. Uh, Gary McDonald, who was a great mentor of yours, was one of our early mentors, Gary and Elaine. And, uh, you know, so many of the handlers at the time were so helpful. And, uh, you know, everyone seemed to encourage, you know, new blood at the time. And uh, although we were very competitive, uh, we tried to keep our nose clean. And, uh, you know, we always kind of felt like outsiders, though, even with guys like yourself, who we know quite well and associated with in weekend after weekend, instead of going for, you know, that Sunday night dinner with all the handlers after the show, we had that five hour drive and we hopped in our car and and, and drove back home or, or, or like you say, we, we had invested into the big rig of the time and really enjoyed it. So we treated it like a business. Yeah. So that's, you know, how I, I would urge any handlers or anybody in the dog game even if you're in it as a hobby you do need to take a business person's approach to it because it can be you know very financially draining for some or it can be very financially rewarding as it has been for Wendy and I being able to develop this successful business and and you've had a successful offspring in Jody as well who's uh, who's become quite a prominent handler anywhere she goes so. well one of the um one of the favorite uh, comments wendy paquette made at one time was that um we were at a judging seminar and we introductions around the room there's like 40 judges and all of the judges had to say what their greatest accomplishment in dogs were yeah. the aspiring judges and people were talking about winning the national and showing at crufts or whatever Wendy Paquette stood up and said, I produced Jody Paquette. And that's <laughs> been my biggest success. So you are right. We are very proud of Jody and uh, you know what she's done, what she's accomplished, and um, how she's conducted herself and her business. And uh, you know, the uh, one of the things we taught Jody <clears throat> from the very beginning that uh, care of the dogs is the most important aspect. Of being a dog handler. The winning will come if you properly care and train the dogs. That, that sort of goes into my next question because I was going to say, what advice would you have for a young handler? Well, um, bring two hats. I'll start with the handler hat and then we'll move on. <laughs> well, one of oh, our philosophies, yeah, one of our philosophies that holds true for not only handlers, but holds true for exhibitors and breeders alike. Um, We've always believed that uh, in competing with creativity, not negativity, when our competition prevailed over us, we bred better dogs, we groomed more, we trained more, and success followed. And this is opposed to those who competed with negativity. And there's many of them out there. Oh, I know. And they find every excuse to explain their losses from the crooked judges to an unlevel un, um, playing field, we just recommend to people, work harder, use your passion, your dedication, and you too will succeed. I mean, look to Wendy and I. Again, I've mentioned non-doggy people from remote Northern Ontario 
With our passion and dedication and commitment to the sport of purebred dogs, we've been able to achieve, you know, which, you know, I, I humbly say is quite a great career and, um, you know, reputation in the dog game. So that, that would be my best advice. You know, I've already mentioned finding great members, mentors, but do compete with creativity. Stop the whining and the complaining. Stop bashing the AKC, the CKC, because there's nothing that they rules that they have that will prevent you from attaining the success you want to attain in dogs if you put your nose to the grindstone and do again have that positive outgoing temperament where you compete creativity, creativity, blah, 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 creatively and uh, <laughs> stop being so negative, you know, stop, you know, some little thing happens and you want to quit or you tr try to blame everyone else for your misfortune. You are the maker of your own bed. So get out there and work hard and you too will succeed. And I'm sure, Will, you did not succeed without a lot of hard work, heartbreak, passion and dedication, just like all top dog people have. Well, that, that's good advice, Richard. So when did you, like how, how long was your handling career? It was actually short lived. It was from about 1974 to 1995. Well, that's not that short. <laughs> well, you, you're, it is true that, you know, being a handler is a lot of work and, uh, you know, from, you know, constantly being on the road and away from your family and all of these things. You know, we were, uh, again, relatively blessed because uh, being the smart businessmen we were, we moved my parents into a big semi-detached ranch house on our Wenrick homestead. And when Wendy and I were away, they basically raised our children and, and loved doing it too. And, and like you say, Jody and, and, and the boys did come to some of the shows, yeah. but they had school too, and and that was important. Very good. Um, so, did you say what year you stopped? Ninety four. So you said ninety five, and then we got into judging, and uh, you know, again, we were blessed with uh, you know being very popular, and uh, got lots of assignments, and went through our judges' accreditation to become all breed judges in record time of uh, eleven and a half years. So we were very pleased there too. Um, like you say, I keep getting ahead of myself. You asked about when we got into terriers and, yeah, and like lakelands. Back in the mid eighties as handlers, we were very strong in groups two, um, five, uh, five and six. Um, as you remember, we had many days where we'd win all of those groups every day. And I did see a void in terriers and terrier presentation in Canada. We had so many great owner handlers, you know, of the time. You know, I think back of Marg Moran, Penny Bell Score, you know, all of those people who, and, and the Frasers who, who, you know, had such great dogs. But there weren't too many Canadian handlers that specialized in the terrier breeds. So I decided, well, you know, I should learn something about terriers because there was a void there. And being the businessman I was, I could make more money if I could manage to put down a terrier decent. And so uh, went to Montgomery. We'd been going to Montgomery for several years. And we met a young couple named Jim and Cheryl Emmer. And uh, they had some really nice lakeys. At the time, unfortunately, they did not have any puppies, but they had this one-year-old male dog that for one reason or another did not get along well with Jim and Cheryl and and the dog just didn't thrive there and they offered him to me they said he's got a bit of a weak temperament but if you do some work on it I'm sure he'll come around because he was a decent specimen of the breed and one thing they did say is he carried a beautiful coat factor be a great learner dog for you and you know the story, uh, you know, we, we did bring him back to Canada and uh, sure enough, he blossomed in his, uh, his mental outlook and he was, as many remember, one of the most steady carriers on the circuit. He gave his heart out every day and he was the kind of dog, if I was busy, I could throw on a grooming table in the middle of 
anyone set up or even near the rings and wander over and show my next dog and be assured that Danny would still be on that table greeting all the spectators and just enjoying life. So um, self-taught to groom the terriers. I did have some help from Marie Prosperi, a Westie breeder, uh, Brickett Hill uh, Westies, and uh, she showed me the basics. And I went to the dog shows and I spied on all my fellow terrier people, learning how to do some stripping and some raking. And uh, it took me four or five months to get the dog into decent condition. And uh, the story's, uh, you know, kind of a history after that. He uh, went on to be top terrier three years in a row. Um, the uh, and eventually culminated his career, his last day in the dog show ring. You, I know you ask a lot of people about their greatest win. Mine had to be best in show at Credit Valley in the top dog race where he was number four on Sunday morning and ended up walking out of the building, number one dog, all breeds. That's how close the top dog race was that year. And that best in show at Credit Valley under Joe Gregory gave him, I think, 1,500 points, which was a large number of points back in the day. And he became number one all breed. And it was such a close race that year. We couldn't tell whether Max the Doberman, owned by the Whites, Richard and Mary White, was top dog or whether one of the poodles, uh, both Carol and um, uh, Susan had top poodles out, Banner and I can't remember Carol's Asia. dog. But, yeah. Banner and and, Asia, yeah. Yeah, and it was a great race and, and a fun race. And you know, the thing I remember back about then was people were more supportive of each other. It wasn't the cutthroat nastiness we see today in some top dog races. All four and five of us competed, uh, you know, head to head every weekend, and we congratulated each other, and we were glad when other people won. So one of my pet peeves is when exhibitors don't have proper respect for their competition, and all they do is talk negative about them and downgrade them, instead of just accepting that, again, other people can have great dogs too and create, uh, compete creatively, like I've mentioned before, and you will eventually have a very high winning percentage. And I'd like to think Wendy and I had a decently high winning percentage. You certainly did. You, know, you guys did great in that, that era. I, w I was just a kid, but you know, I remember. <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun because, uh, you know, um, Basically, all of our talents were self-taught. Wendy became an expert in Yorkies, an expert in Maltese, and obviously was always, uh, you know, from the beginning, an expert in Shih Tzu. Um, uh, I had to learn how to scissor standard poodles and toy poodles, and my job was the scissoring. Her job was the, the top knots and the, the final touches. And uh, so we each had our roles as handlers, and uh, it was kind of fun. And we always had great assistants and, and uh, you know, in a lot of the, the handlers from today, Ray Yurick, and uh, I can remember Michael Collins was, uh, you know, never became a dog person, but he was he was one of our uh, one of our assistants back when, and and one of today's handlers who's very successful with the Lakelands today, uh, Kim Wendling, you know, worked for us quite a few summers, and you know, there's Tannis Burst and Kim uh, Kaufman, and and you name. Uh, Mandy Carlson, a lot of them worked for us as handlers, uh, assistants, assistants, and of course, the most famous of them all, Jody Paquette. <laughs> That's for sure. So then you became judge. You, you decided to start being a judge in 94, 95. Yes. And you started in, did you start in Terriers? Or did, you, did you start in non, uh, non scoring I can't remember. Um, I started in Terriers because Wendy Paquette and I wanted to be um, take opposite groups so that we could become an all breed judge as a team. Sure. So we always worked on different groups. So Wendy started in the non sporting group because uh, that's where the Shih Tzu are in Canada in the non sporting group. And I started in the Terrier group. And once we did that, Wendy went to Hounds. I went to um, 
I think, toys, or no, Wendy went to toys and I went to hounds. And so eventually within four or five years, we had all seven groups. So we were very um, marketable that way. No, for sure. And, you know, I, I would encourage any judging couple to, um, if they're going to go through to the, the, the final step of becoming an all breed judge, they should uh, embark upon it that same way. And uh, it did prove well because we were in, you know, we got to start charging a fee a lot sooner than the average permit judge could because we could actually judge a whole dog show. Sure. Yeah. That would, business thing again, you know, it keeps, yeah. <laughs> it's coming back to business. Uh, it is, it's true. It, it's uh, a lot of handlers and breeders don't look at it that way and they, they find some downfalls because of it. Um, what, uh, well, I lost my train of thought there. We were talking about judging. Mentors, about judging mentors. Do you have any mentors that you would you, you would rely upon? I had uh, so many, and um, we were blessed again. Uh, we got taken under the wing of judges like Ann Rogers Park. Uh, I can remember one time because we were showing dogs that were associated with her bloodline, and and we all remember Annie's oftentimes would stop her breed judging. Heaven forbid if the judge did that today, they'd be run out of town on a, you know, on the, on the nearest uh, rail. But uh, Annie would stop her judging over and watch standards at one time. So I was really impressed. I'd really done this dog up perfect, and I thought he looked amazing. And we went ringside, and Annie walked over, and because it was one of her breeding, she she says, "Richard, go and get some scissors." She grabs the dog by the tail, twists the about three or four times and wax off about an inch and a half off the top of his tail. And she said, now he's groomed perfectly. So, <laughs> you know, we did have great mentors like that. And, and Jane Forsythe, uh, Bob and Elaine Whitney were great judging mentors. And, and a lot of names people won't remember, you know, Barbara Knoll, James Kilgannon, Sam Back, uh, Sam Back. Wow. the Loftuses. So many of them helped us in our career as judges, like, you know, giving us good pointers and, and supporting our, our careers because, you know, in order to move quickly in your accreditation and not to become frustrated, you need to get the assignments. And we were blessed to have assignments we had to turn down oftentimes. So, you know, a lot of our mentors with respect to that. And, you know, all the old handlers when we were handlers, you know, I mentioned Gary, uh, Brian Taylor. You know, you name them, you know, they were our mentors and, you know, Garrett Lambert and, and uh, Billy Mill and all those were our peers at the time. And, you know, you, you didn't even have to ask for help. They'd come over and, you know, you're working on your terrier and they say, oh, a little more here, a little more there. And no, no, you're not holding that knife right or, you know, smart enough or, you know, and and it was a great camaraderie back then now. People say there's not the same camaraderie today. Well, I challenge that too, because I do see a lot of the handlers working together, getting along and exhibitors having a lot of fun at dog shows because, you know, that's what it's all about. If you're not having fun, why the hell would you do it? Well, because sure. it's a lot of work. <laughs> no question about that. <laughs> so what are some of your more, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure most, 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 all your assignments are exciting. Well, what are some of the ones that really come to mind that you had fun judging or even dogs that you found over the years, Richard, or dogs that you wished you could have been a part of? I, I want to hear all that as well. <laughs> well, again, we've judged in almost uh, every province across the country. We've judged in every province across the country. And, uh, or you know, we uh, haven't been up to the Yukon yet, but uh, we do have an invitation to go up there. Uh, all the Canadian dog shows, you know, the... Um, we judged at, at most of the, the great ones. Uh, this summer, I'll be judging at the AKC shows, the Alberta Kennel Club shows. A little disappointed the venue won't be Spruce Mountains uh, Meadows this year, but uh, I'm sure they'll have a great show and a great venue. So Alberta Kennel Club's uh, quite a great show. Where are they holding it? Um, some type of fairgrounds just south of the city. Oh. You know, I, I, I forget the name. I don't worry about things like that. If I can look it up, I don't remember it. I'm too old well, to Bruce worry about the new show. Oh my God. 
And one of my uh, first uh, assignments in the USA uh, was in California, and I got to judge some beautiful terriers. I got to judge Tim, the Badlington Terrier, mm-hmm. gave her the group that weekend as my first American group. And uh, I think a few years later, we got invited to judge the, uh, the shows in Kentucky, that great circuit in March. And uh, that was the first time we really got to see great numbers of dogs. Like yeah. I had 98 giant schnauzers the day before the national. And, you know, <laughs> and I'm pleased that I pulled it off because uh, my winner's dog and winner's bitch were the same winner's dog, winner's bitch from the national the next day. And my best of breed and best opposite were just reversed. Oh, wow. the, the national judge, uh, I, I believe it was Dave Kirkland uh, on the day, he gave uh, the dog best and specialty, and I gave the bitch best and specialty, and I gave the dog best opposite. So that was kind of a fun assignment. But, um, you know, again, the blessings now are that I've got to travel to six different continents in the last 10, 15 years in 30 different countries and have judged in so many amazing places. Uh, most memorable recently has been uh, a couple of years ago, judging in, in split Croatia for the big split dog shows with all the pomp and pageantry. And, and that was kind of a fun assignment. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, every country we've been able to visit, Australia so many times, uh, they have some big shows and big numbers down there and, and all over Asia, you know, the, you know, I remember judging in Japan the first time and I walked into the toy poodle ring and I had like 40 of them and, and 10 identical specials walk in the ring and they took my breath away. It was like just so amazing to see the quality and depth of a breed like toy poodles in a country like Japan where I personally feel a lot of the great dogs, the great toy poodles have come from in the last decade, uh, you know, from the, you know, the, the, the famed, what, what was the name of that kennel? <laughs> uh, I'm terrible with names. Smash, the smash kennels. And even when I judged in Croatia, I put a smash poodle up to best in show and I didn't well, realize it was one. Well, they're easy, re- easily recognizable, that's for sure. Yeah. Let's see them. Uh, another dog I was judging in Argentina, and uh, I should have remembered her name, which I'm not, but it was a Dogo Argentina, and uh, she was a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful bitch and uh, took my breath away. And, and that's the fun thing about judging dog shows. For the most part, uh, a lot of the dog shows we judge are smaller shows, and it's kind of like handing out ribbons, and you don't have too many decisions to make in a, on any given day. But when two or three top dogs do walk into your ring, it is exciting and it does take your breath away. And it kind of rewards you for all the long hours of travel and all that education and and seminars you attended and reading and reading breed standards over and over again, you know, to make sure that you are knowledgeable in those specific breeds about the correct breed type and obviously know a lot about soundness and temperament in dogs also is very important. So what advice would you give an inspiring judge then, Richard? Um, definitely do your homework. You need to study hard. You need to read not just the breed standards, you need to read the book on the breed. You need to read about the history the nuances of the breed, the banes of the breed. You need to learn all there is to know from other top breeders. You know, don't just go to do a kennel visit at some mediocre kennel and hope you're gonna learn all there is. Yes, go to those kennels, learn something because there's an opportunity to learn all the time, but try to go to the great ones and and ask those people their opinions of the breed and, and what you should be looking for. And that does give you great insight and keep your nose clean. Be honest. I know Wendy Paquette and I, before our very first judging assignment, made a vow to each other that we would always judge the dogs. Forget about all the politics and the bullshit. When it come down to pointing the finger, be sure it's the right dog on the day. And even if it has a history of being a multi, multi best in show winner, if it doesn't perform on the day, or it doesn't, you know, catch your eye on that day, it's not the best dog on the day. So 
work hard, learn about the breeds, learn about the breed histories, work with great mentor breeders, learn all you can about the breed, and don't get over your head. Um, I know um, myself, I, I was very uh, comfortable in my first three and four groups, you know, because we'd showed so many dogs in those groups. And one of the nice things and advantages of coming from a background of a handler is that you have studied breeds. You've studied your competition. You've read the breed standards of the competition. So you know what good points to be promoting of your dog and what, um, you know, because you needed to know the good and bad points of your competition too. So coming from that background as a handler, you know, we did gain a lot of breed experience. So I think that's very important and, uh, you know, work with various breeders and learn all you can. And the day that you as a judge think you know it all, you should retire because it's a, every day is a learning experience. And uh, I learn something new almost every time I judge a good entry of dogs. So you've been, you've been, you guys have been top breeders, top handlers, top judges. Was there any obstacles you had to overcome that, that stick out in your mind? Well, again, um, just the fact that we weren't born and bred into it, it was a little harder go. The fact that we, are ge we were geographically disadvantaged, where the closest dog show was four hours from our hometown. Um, but I don't, you know, we took every opportunity. You know, you can remember back when we were willing to learn and learn from our fellow handlers, learn from judges, learn from breeders. It was always a learning experience. Um, we never promised one client ever that we could win with their dog. We promise them, we'll take extremely good care of your dog. We'll work hard to present that dog to perfection and the winning will come. And there were several clients that we had to, they would bring us dogs and we'd say, why are you going to invest money into specialing this dog when it's not a top one? You know, and even with breeders, we encourage breeders, don't start accumulating a lot of male dogs. Because if you're going to be a top breeder, you need to have top females because you can breed to any dog in the world. You keep a male puppy, it doesn't turn out, you're still going to get into the vine where you're going to want to breed to it. And then you're breeding to mediocrity. So when you have the advantage, especially in today's day and age, of fresh and frozen semen, you can breed to any dog in the world. Yes, some breeders have to have dogs. We had some many top, um, top stud dogs, especially in Shih Tzu, that had influence on the breed over time. But we were a fairly large kennel. You know, in the day, we had up to 50 Shih Tzu. You know, those types of things today are, are almost taboo with the politically correct, too big, you know, all this nonsense. My opinion is if, if you have the facilities the staff, as we always had, um, to properly look after the dogs, you can have as many dogs as you want and have as many litters as you want, especially if you're still contributing to the sport by attending dog shows, showing your dogs, mentoring other people. You know, this, this nonsense today, I mean, look at the great kennels we've had, Betty Hislop. You know, she had like a hundred uh, Cairns and Danes and, you know, uh, uh, you name it, uh, Dick Neen and John Reed Newson in the day when they were actively breeding, I, I, I heard they had like 60, 70 borzoi at one time. You know, the big kennels of the day needed that many dogs, you know, to, to become a kennel. Uh, I, I have a lot of young breeders, been in it five and six years. They say, oh, my line of Shih Tzu or my line of whatever, and I just roll my eyes. I try not to beat them up too bad. But in my humble opinion, you do not have a line until you've been involved for a minimum of 10 years and how many generations that might entail and um, have had some degree of success with being able to produce consistency. The, the biggest compliment we get from our fellow judges and a lot of exhibitors is, 
oh my god i judged in brazil last year and i i, I put up one of your dogs i knew right away when as i was judging it, it must have been a wenrick one and i was so pleased when i heard it was and, and that's the kind of compliments you have where you can actually breed a type that is easily recognizable and do it consistently over a long period of time then you can truly say you have a line you know so you know a lot of the younger breeders take note it takes you got to pay your dues and oh, good we covered all three of your hats there richard yeah we've been in it 50 years and uh, you got to pay your dues no question all right i have one last question for you richard if you could meet well i'm gonna, I'm gonna say because you were so young i'm gonna say if you could meet the 17 year old richard Paquette, is there any advice you'd give them now um not a lot of regrets in my life i have to say that william That's again uh we knew right from the get-go it was going to be hard work and uh i know you've observed us over the years uh, with our setup um the amount of work that went into the presentation of each dog the amount of study learning dedication uh that's the advice i would i would have if i met that young 17 year old richard paquette i'd say do exactly as you did get some great mentors work hard passionately and work with creativity if someone has beaten you in the ring don't go you know being negative and and, and uh, you know poor sportsmanship and all this nonsense work harder train harder groom harder and you will definitely succeed and and apart from creativity the only other pet peeve i have as a judge when people come into the ring with an untrained dog and i i want to embark a philosophy that i've been promoting all my career is the training of a dog only requires five minutes every day the keynote words are every day not every second day every fourth day five times a month it's every day you take your little puppy in a very happy positive atmosphere you throw them on the table and you're fairly firm with them and you stack them and you slap them and you put their tail up and you check their testicles and you check their bites the whole time happy crazy bouncy and yeah, they're not going to behave well at the beginning, but five minutes every day after 30 days, they'll be standing pretty rock solid. And once you're finished that little minute or two on the table, put them on the ground on a loose lead and let them gallop and run, play with their favorite toy. And near the end of that play session, get a little bit tighter lead on them and let them focus a little more on the bait and do that up and down at a nice trot and end the whole session on a fun session but only let it last five minutes every day. Yes, you do need to go to handling classes once a week and get some socialization and stuff like that. But if you trained your dogs for five minutes every day, they'd all be puppy and show winners at six months and one day. So there's my advice to everyone is um, great mentors, be very positive and creative and uh, do your hard work and homework and on your training, five minutes every day in a happy, fun session. You don't ever, are, are we used, always use that positive training philosophy. We never disciplined a dog unless they attempted to bite us. Then they would get a little bit of a shake or, a, you know, whatever it took to make them appreciate that that was behavior unbecoming. Otherwise, they could chew my... You know, they could have chewed uh, Wendy's Christian Louboutin shoes or whatever and never got a scolding for it because that was our fault. So very positive, very uh, positive environment. And you will have that same blessed success that I've had. That's great, Richard. Well, thank you. It's good, good to catch up with you. I haven't seen you for a long time. Oh, for sure. And let's hope... Uh, you know, this COVID thing opens up this summer and we can get to see each other again. Exactly, in person. Well, I appreciate your time, Richard. I'm glad I know you're busy where you are and up there at Wenrick. You guys are always quite busy up there. Uh, say hi to the family for me and uh, 
until I see you again. <laughs> and thank you, William, for this opportunity. And uh, again, looking forward to seeing you in the coming months. Thanks, Richard. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Richard. Appreciate your time. We enjoyed speaking with you. If you like what you see here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to find out what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexander.net. If you want to get a hold of me, go to dogshowtips at gmail.com. And don't forget about the Dog Show Drive, the podcast that comes out every Thursday on Stitcher, Spotify, and Apple with myself and Mr. Wade Cavanaugh. Till next week, guys. Bye-bye.